Are we on, Michelle? We are, and people are coming in. We've got about 13 so far. So Okay, super. Well, hey, guys, uh, we'll give this a few minutes for everyone else to join us, and uh, then we'll get things kicked off probably about 102-ish. If you want to let us know where you're coming in from, that's always a fun game. I'm in Boston, if anybody cares. <laughs> I care, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> I'm in Michigan, but nobody cares about that. I like, oh, Kentucky. Nice. There you go. Reno. Anthony, you're, wait. <laughs> okay, I got a lot of East, East Coast, Midwest, Kalamazoo. How close? Yeah, we got another Michigan out here. Yeah. That's like two and a half hours away. All right. Ooh, I've got a fellow Tampa Bay neighbor here and Eric. I'm here in Tampa as well. Nice. All right. Seminole. Oh, okay. Oh, Dana's repping uh, Canada. Can't forget Vancouver. Oh, yeah. Love Vancouver. Ryan's also down in Florida, but Southern. Just a little bit south of you. Yep. Oh, somebody else from Michigan. Oh, Ooh, I like Spring Oregon too. Mm -hmm. I just like that whole that whole upper Northwest Oregon, Vancouver. It's beautiful. All right. Want to kick us off, Michelle? Sure. Well, welcome everyone um, to boost your sales success, where we're going to take a di deep dive actually into our sales toolkit that we created probably, I don't know, a couple of months ago, Amy, it was, um, and it has four pieces to it. Just to give you a brief overview, there's a brandable slide deck, the sales playbook, the pricing strategy calculator, and what's the fourth one? Oh, the SASI report. Sorry. How can I write a SASI report? Um, so we will take a look at each one and let me introduce you to the team so we can kick it off. Um, we have Amy Carr, who is our VP of marketing here at SAS Alerts. Uh, Ryan Riccardi, who is our VP of partner success. And we also have a special MSP guest with us, Chris Burns, who is the owner and CEO of Techie Gurus in Michigan. So welcome, Chris. And welcome everyone. Um, if you have questions during during the webinar, just feel free to ask them in the Q and A, and we will do them live or as we can get to them. All right. And in case you have not had a chance to download the sales toolkit, uh, we did send it out with the webinar registration, but not everyone clicks on all the links. Uh, Michelle's going to share that in the chat if you want to have access to it um, ungated without having to put in your information again, and then you can uh, follow along as well as we go through some of these pieces. So Michelle mentioned that we've got four pieces here. We've got the sales playbook, um, which is really meant to give you a step-by-step -step walkthrough guide of, of how you can pitch your SaaS security services to your um, customers, to your prospects. We've got the brandable slide deck that is, is even beyond brandable. We've given you the actual PowerPoint presentation so you can take it and make it your own. It just is, gives you a starting point. Uh, we're going to spend the bulk of our time going through the slide deck. Um, some of the other pieces are a little more self-explanatory, but we'll walk through the, the, the slide deck and, and talk through um, how you would pitch that over to your prospects. We've got the pricing the pricing strategy calculator, uh, which just helps you walk through a, a, a few different pricing models that are out there. So you can play with it, select which one um, might work best for you. And then Michelle mentioned, we've got the SASE report that came out earlier this year. And this really is just filled with information and statistics that we were able to find around what's happening in SaaS application security. So it really just gives you a little bit more information and knowledge that you can take over to your customers and your prospects to uh, really show that you've got a handle on everything SaaS security, build out some of that trust. So digging into the sales playbook first, 
Um, this is really meant to be a guide for you and your sales team. It, it gives you a, a way to standardize your sales process across your sales team. It gives them a way to um, step-by-step walk through a, a, a tried and, and true proven process that others have have used and, and brought that feedback back to us to show us, you know, these are the things that we've done to really sell these services. And it allows you to have this wow factor that we're going to get into um, and really set yourself apart from competitors who aren't following this type of process when they're when they're trying to sell security services. So key elements of the playbook. Again, we're not going to walk through this in that much detail. We're going to spend the most of our time here on the slide deck. But when you get into it, you know, it talks through how getting first getting the initial meeting and trying to get to that wow factor. So how do you get to the initial meeting is really it's just letting your prospects know that there's so much going on behind the scenes that they don't see in their in their especially in their SaaS applications. Um, and you're able to, taking up only 90 seconds of their time, get them access to a cybersecurity assessment or risk report that will really show them what's happening. And most of them are going to be, again, wowed, um, really surprised to see what's happening from, from uh, login attempts, um, from different countries, from data exfiltration, people viewing confidential files, um, you know, the potential attacks that are out there. there. There's just so much that you're going to be able to show them and, and show your expertise to really get in there and close that deal. Um, you know, and, and maybe, maybe you find nothing and that would be, that would be great, right? Um, but for, in most cases, I, I think we all know that there's going to be, there's going to be a few blips that come up at the very least. Um, Chris, I, I, I see you shaking your head. You, you want to, you want to talk to that a little bit. You're always going to find something, whether it's somebody that doesn't have MFA turned on, which could be an executive. They maybe have logged in from a location they weren't at. You'll, you'll find something. Yeah. Um, and again, it just shows the level of expertise that you have, and it shows that you've got the tools available to you to, to not only detect it, but then be able to, to put an end to that as well and make sure that they're fully secure. Um, and in, in this case, you know, you offer it to them for free. They don't have anything to lose um, except just more information about what's happening in their environment. Um, we walk through the process in the, the playbook. Um, and, and really provide a step-by-step -step guide as to how you can build that trust and get their goods. Because you, you don't want to ask them for their credentials. They're able to enter their credentials themselves into SAS alerts and be able to um, do that in an anonymous manner. Um, so that really helps to, to build a little bit more trust there. Um, and there's a whole process that we go through to get them to get that assessment started so that you can build your trust and credibility along the way. So um, I'm going to pull up on the screen a sample of the SAS cyber assessment report. Can you guys see this? Okay, Ryan, can you see this? Yeah, you're good to go. Cool. Uh, talk, talk through this a little bit. Tell everybody what we're looking at. All right. Well, I want to start by just giving you guys a caution that the one that Amy has up is one that we use for testing. Um, if you ever saw 25,081 logged events and 13,000 of them were critical, you have significantly larger issues um, than really what's going on in their SaaS environments. So, but the idea behind this is to simplify a, a complex concept to people who haven't really considered it. And I, we've, we've taken this from a lot of our partners that we're introducing not only a, a really innovative tool and a, and a clever concept for securing things, but we're also introducing people to the fact that this needs to be secured, that these are things that are happening. Uh, it's Most people have been blind to this for quite a while. So putting it in a consumable fashion is critically important. This map is fairly straightforward. It shows you activity across the globe, whether it's authorized or not, obviously color-coded for your convenience, just to indicate to folks at, at a glance, like, hey, look, there's a lot of stuff going on every single day, every single month inside of these fast platforms, whether they're M365, Salesforce, Dropbox, uh, Google Workspace, whatever you're using, uh, there's really no one that has the, the time or the wherewithal to look around through 25,000 events to see if anything is critical. So let's simplify that. The SASE report, I don't know if we'll dig all the way into it, indicates that less than 2% of the things that we bring in are deemed critical. So this is obviously not a good example of that as a, a dev environment, but 
finding those needles in those uh, haystacks is virtually impossible. SAS alerts makes it so just the needles are showing. Uh, that's kind of the, the, the kick of the map. Here's something just to start it with. And then if you continue down that page, Amy, we'll break it down. And these are, if you hit the legend, you can actually get rid of things that you know they don't care about. So if Amy was to mouse over and say, hey, we don't care about authentication successes, the second one down IAM event, we can kick those off the list and just show, hey, here's some things that we do think are prevalent and that we should probably look into. So the more you tick off of there, the, the clearer that picture gets. Uh, go ahead and continue down. This one's important. So failed logins, this is a good indicator to folks that like, hey, you might not think you're under attack. You might not think the data that you've got inside of your system is important. Um, the problem is until an attacker gets in, they don't know that. And once they get in, they've got something of yours and it's worth it to you to secure. So if you see people like our automated testing, the one that triggers most of our alerts, um, it's, it's highly improbable that somebody fat fingered their password 659 times in 18 days. Uh, it's much more likely that's a spray attack. So this is a, the ingress point to go in and say, we know these things are happening now. You might not have known before this call, but now that you know they're happening, the next things that I recommend are going to be critically important. If that system doesn't, or that user doesn't have MFA enabled or conditional access policies configured, it's not a matter of like when or if that's going to happen, it's when somebody's going to get in if they continue to try. So pointing out to them that whether they're aware of it or not, people are aggressively attacking their users is going to be a big part of selling the value of protecting the system. Whether they use SAS alerts to do it or not, just being aware that it's something that warrants attention. Keep going. Account alerts is a good way to tell on folks and tell you who's responsible for, for the, the vast majority of your failures inside of security. Um, so this shows you the top 10 accounts in your book of business or in a specific customer um, that are triggering alerts. You keep going down this one. And this one's kind of fun. You can actually see when the weekends are, um, if you're, you, you pay attention very closely. Um, but you can also see that user attacks tend to trend right alongside of regular user data. That's for an initial ingress point. Um, that's to kind of like subvert what folks are doing. The actual activity that's malicious will tend to happen when there are no eyes on glass. Um, and you tend to see maybe little spikes towards the end of the week on Friday when they know people are kind of winding down. This is a good day to try to get into things. So those little red lines at the bottom are failed attempts to log in from areas that maybe people shouldn't have um, right around when everybody else is normally acting. That way, there's a whole lot of data to sift through to find those attempts, and you're less likely to notice it. Now, if they succeed, They'll sit back for a little bit, wait till nobody's watching, and then they'll go ahead and implement email forwarding rules, uh, maybe like escalate privileges, maybe start pulling stuff from SharePoint, all things that most folks wouldn't be aware of if they were relying on an MDR or, am I allowed to name competitors on this, Amy? Sure. Okay. Or like a Huntress or an Arctic Wolf that screenshots this every four hours. I'm not saying they're bad products, but if you were to hop in, do some stuff and hop back out and within that four hour window, which is way more time than most of them need, wouldn't get screen grabbed. Real-time alerting is what's picking this up. Keep heading down. Sure. Unapproved logins. Kind of goes without saying, you whitelist locations by the user or by the organization of where you expect them to log in. So let's say for the SAS alerts example, the vast majority of us are in the States, but we do have developers that are outside of the States. So those guys are whitelisted for their countries and we're whitelisted for the United States. If I sign in from elsewhere, um, that's bad. If they sign in from outside of their country of origin, that's bad. So when you see somebody successfully logging in, typically this report will not have a bunch of names on it. If you see anyone showing up as logged in from an unapproved location, that warrants further attention. And we have reports for that. The user detail reports are a good example where we can see where are they logging in from? What do we know about that IP address? Is it a VPN? Is it a known anonymous user? Is it a known threat? We provide all of that info. And then you can use the analysis report to see exactly what that person was doing when they were in that region to figure out if it was them or not. We get way more advanced, obviously. You can leverage your RMM data to make sure even if they're out of the country, they're on a known system for you. Um, but the idea for the report is to show folks, these things are occurring, these things do need your attention, and no one's been doing it for you yet. So let me be the first to introduce you to what you should be doing. Uh, Chris, you got anything that I've hit so far that you wanna weigh in on? Uh, we we use the, the unapproved and approved login more often than we admit because we we deal with a lot of people that have outside developers we deal with a lot of companies that have people like in the philippines and things like that so we do the same thing we have to approve them and then we monitor them yep consistently Perfect. and then we we use respond but you're not there yet so yeah we'll we'll get to that part. I, I, like i would love <laughs> to see 
Yeah, we've got, we, we don't have that much time and I could talk about respond and the capabilities yeah. of how this tool can make your life easier and, and remove tickets for forever. Um, but I'm told that's not why I'm here. So I'm not, I'm going <laughs> to. Uh, unapproved locations, unsurprisingly, we'll tell you where we're seeing people sign in from in our dev environment. I have the guys that are our developers um, out of the country. They VPN into New York to do stuff. It throws an alert, but just as a demonstration. Uh, and then the externally shared file events. This one's critical. Uh, most of our partners re haven't realized how poorly configured their end users are for externally shared files. Um, for just a real quick pro tip before you guys do anything else next time you're in somebody's environment, go disable the ability to anonymously share files. It's a button click. It's not hard. It's in your DLP settings. I don't think it requires anything beyond, beyond business premium. But you see if that second one there says anonymous. That means that people have the ability inside of a tenant to share files and not admit who it was that shared it. So once that happens, that's gone. That link is out there and anybody who has the link can pull that data down and there is nothing you can do about it. You can disable that capability. So at the very least, you can go to the person who shared it and say, hey, why did you share that? And to whom did you share it? Um, and maybe that's against your practices. They won't know that. And a lot of your users will see that and be like, whoa, what are they doing sharing that many files at all? They shouldn't be sharing anything. Might not mean much to you. It'll mean something to most of your partners. That's most of the cybersecurity risk report. You pick and choose the parts that fit for the partner that you're talking to. What's going to be, it depends on what you got on the phone for, right? If you have a suspected business email compromise and that's why they're talking to you, probably stay up top, show them what's been going on and what's wrong with their config settings. If they're curious as to why their competitors suddenly have a lead list of theirs, externally shared file events would be something to tunnel into. Uh, the report is designed for you to use to educate partners. Uh, one of the beauties of SAS alerts is we don't really sell it. You shouldn't have to sell it either. What we do is educate folks as to the risk and the product sells itself. Uh, and Chris, we were talking earlier, you say, uh, told us that you use this report a lot when you're talking to your customers, when you're talking to prospects. Um, what do they think the first time they see this report? Well, it depends. If you start digging down into it and you start showing like a CEO logging in from different countries, like... Uh, let's say they're in Vietnam, Japan, Russia, China, United States, and I don't know, Brazil, all at the same time, they get a little sus suspicious of what's going on. Right. So we've used that for prospecting. We've used, we actually use it during our, um, our presentation to them too, after an action plan, because we do a risk assessment up front. So once we get through that, this is part of the risk assessment, but then we, we dive back into it too during the sales process, post that for the action plan, just kind of reiterate, hey, look, you're not doing what you're saying you're doing. We actually used this uh, a month ago for a large customer of ours. They thought they had MFA turned on and we showed them logins that were successful from all over the world. And they're like, what are you talking about? They had it enabled, but they never enforced it. So uh, just yeah, never enablement, that, yeah. Yeah, enablement yeah, versus enforcement. Yeah, they just never, they never set up MFA. So they had uh, their, their CFO was, was compromised and a bunch of other people that shouldn't have been compromised. So it was really powerful. That's actually a new threat vector, uh, br browser hijacking and token theft, bypass MFA and login. So most of the tools that you guys are familiar with using like conditional access policies won't pick up on it because conditional access policies fire after a login. So if somebody does successfully steal a token, sign in from another country, no login happens, no conditional access, no violations. It does trigger in SAS alerts though, as a shell event in a different country with a different IP address. Uh, cool. Well, thanks guys for that overview. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the brandable pitch deck. I'm going to pull up the deck itself um, here in a minute. Um, but essentially, you know, we provided this to give you guys a starting point to, to pitch this and, and educate your customers and your prospects as you're, you're trying to sell them additional cybersecurity services. So it's definitely brandable. It, it's up to you. Um, you know, if you make additional changes to it, if you piecemeal it all together, um, but I'm going to pull it up now and we're, if my machine will cooperate, it doesn't want to come over. Hold on. Let's escape that. Sorry about that, guys. There we go. We'll do it this way. Apparently it doesn't want two PowerPoint presentations running at the same time. So this is what the pitch deck looks like. And um, that in your uh, presenter view, just a heads up. It's not yeah. switch screens. Yeah. Hit swap displays. Thank you. 
Okay. So, um, so like I said, you know, some of our partners like to mention that they've got SAS alerts, um, running in the background for them. Some don't. So again, it's, it's up to, to you folks, how you decide to use this, um, we kick off uh, with a quote that I'm going to let Ryan here speak to. Amateurs hack systems, professionals hack people. I have a horrible habit of getting my head ahead of myself in this slide deck, but uh, Bruce Schneier, if you're not familiar with him, uh, he wrote a book called uh, Data versus Goliath. I, I highly recommend you read it. One of the lines that I liked out of it is this one. The um, reason it's, it's critical to understand is our, the people that we're fighting against are smart and irritatingly so, and they get to crowdsource crime. So we're always trying to stay ahead of them as best as we can. And they figured out what you guys have already known is that the weakest aspect of your cybersecurity stack is the person sitting in the chair behind it. So the, the endpoints don't matter anymore. You guys have those locked down. Your, your antivirus systems are great. Your firewalls, all the things that you've got built out, it, they've found a way to just bypass the need to chase down endpoints. Just hack the person. People by and large, if you, what what is it? 49% of them are below average intelligence. So. They'll find someone inside of your company that's willing to click through something, follow something, or just really wants to be helpful and doesn't think about the fact that people are malicious. So they're hacking people. Amateurs are hacking systems. And that's indicated by the next slide, if you plan on going into it, Amy. Um, I do. 61% of breaches are identity driven. I actually have updates coming for you guys here shortly on the IC3 numbers. Um, but just for context on that second one, IC3 had 19,954 business email compromises reported in a single year with a $2.4 billion price tag. A 2022 number is $2.7 billion, slightly higher number on that side. Um, but just for context between that and the, the thing everybody thinks is the worst, which is ransomware, $34.4 million lost in the same time frame to ransomware. Million with an M compared to $2.4 billion with a B. For business email compromise. So if this isn't what you guys are focused on, if this, if your customers don't think that's important, then the failure comes down to us and to you because they will make an educated decision and they'll make the right decision if you give them the right information to move forward. These things are important for them to understand. These aren't one-offs. These aren't weird. The vast majority of people are experiencing business email compromise. This is why the focus is where it is now. Well, and I can speak to that too. Most of the stuff that when companies come to us, it's almost always BEC. Yeah. Ransomware happens, but and other events, but mostly it's BEC, and then they try to do social engineering from inside of their team. And, ran, and ransomware still happens as a result of business email compromise. It's oh, sometimes yeah, the neck that they take, but that's the first thing. That's where we have to stop them. And then we have Microsoft's response, um, which is, is is great. I'm gonna I'm gonna have Chris speak to to. Uh, how how yeah. how he feels about this shortly, but essentially, you know, Microsoft does what what it can. Um, but anything that happens, if you let somebody into your system, even inadvertently, and there are losses that are incurred um, by Microsoft or by somebody else, they are gonna look to you for to to be held responsible. Um, if not you, the MSP, then your your customer uh, who's going to be looking to you. So um, so Chris, uh, what do you, what do you think about this? It's funny how they're not responsible to us necessarily, but we're responsible to them. So they give us a platform. It's our responsibility to secure that platform. Secure by design is not something that has been completely rolled out. Whether it's Google, whether it's Microsoft, we're responsible once we get a platform to secure it. The customers own their data. That's their data and they have to protect it. So if their accounts get hit because they didn't have MFA enabled, that's their fault. But what we're seeing is more and more, they're using that email to then try to get to their customers and actually do like wire fraud or invoice fraud or something like that, where at some point litigation probably will become a bigger thing in between companies. And what if Microsoft comes back on you? So we haven't seen Microsoft do anything to our customers yet, but it's still something to keep in mind. Yeah, the, the more likely thing, and uh, Mark asked for an example, I assume he's referring to how we could be held liable for Microsoft. The likelihood of Microsoft doing anything to anyone is, is virtually zero. However, what this does do is absolve them of any responsibility. So an example would be one from a, a partner of ours who may or may not be on this call. Uh, one of their customers had a breach where they, one of their customers' customers had a breach where they sent an email in and said, hey, we're updating paying information. Um, this is where we need you to send the, the um, payments from here on out. 
So the person who received it, because it was from a legitimate email address, somebody they interact with before, they went ahead and updated the payment information. A few months go by, the actual business calls and said, hey, you know, you're, you, you owe us $17,000. And they said, no, we paid it. Uh, we didn't get it. Well, we sent it to the bank account you told us to send it to. Shared, went back and forth, realized what happened. Um, Microsoft just made it super clear that that's not their fault, not their problem. They're not responsible for someone else clicking a phishing email, falling for it. And that company who paid 17 grand still owed 17 grand. And there's nothing that they're going to do to help you. So you need to start protecting yourselves. Yep, for sure. Um, and a lot of cases, the, the, the folks that you're dealing with, these small businesses, they they don't necessarily think that that they're going to be a target. Um, things happen. I mean, I'm sure you all see it all the time. There's they're not always super tech savvy. Uh, sometimes they're naive. Ryan, you said earlier, sometimes they're just trying to be helpful. They get an email and they would like, oh, so and so needs my help. I'm going to hop in here and I'm going to do what I need to do to get them what they need. Um, and things happen, and they may have some sort of breach happen and they don't even realize it. They've, they've authenticated somebody in and they think that what they've done is perfectly legitimate and it can be days or weeks or even months with somebody just running around in the background of their Microsoft 365 account. Um, Can I give you a, sure. Kind of um, yeah, please. Interesting an analogy. I don't know how many, I saw people from Kansas city and all over the place. So I assume we've got some football fans in here. Uh, the what you don't know can hurt you thing is if you think about the NFL circa 2019, they implemented what was called the uh, the blindside block rule, uh, effectively saying it's super unfair to hit a competing person where they can't see you coming from. So if you're on a parallel target and they can't see where you're coming from, you hit them, it's a penalty. Uh, we unfortunately can't fro uh, like scream foul if somebody hits us where we're not looking. So we have to look everywhere. And this is a spot that's the biggest blind spot, spot for MSPs and for their end users right now. It comes down to the education aspect. And this speaks to it as well. Um, they, they might not think that they're at risk of being blindsided by a very large NFL player, um, but they very much are. Every, every single person that walks out on the field that does business is at risk of getting hit. So since we can't say that's not fair, we need to make sure we've got eyes all the way around our heads. That's yep. what this is referring to. Perfect, thanks, Ryan. And then, you know, we, we cover the cost of a breach all the time. We all know what it is. Your customers may not realize it goes far beyond financial losses that they may incur. Um, there are business interruptions, there are legal ramifications, there's HR ramifications, um, potential PR crises. So there, there, it goes so much further than simply financial losses if they were to get some sort of a breach. And really, it's all very simple. If you can fix this for them, you can simplify it quite easily. Uh, you're able to monitor their SaaS business applications for suspicious activity. You can get alerts in real time when any sort of um, ac suspicious activity is detected. And Chris mentioned earlier, respond. There's automatic remediation um, that, that you can build to, to shut them out immediately. And then you can report to them monthly how you are helping them and how you're keeping all of their data safe. Um, Chris, can you talk through um, a little bit of, of how you use the respond module to automate some of this? Yeah, so we don't have it rolled out for every customer because we, we go through and talk to them and get their sign off first because it turns out if you turn off a CEO's email, they don't know about it, they get a little mad at you. So we go through and we get we get their approval that any login that happens outside of their approved location automatically gets disabled if that happens. So we've had that, but we have to make sure they get signed off on that. When we that's that's our main source right now for the respond module, um, is is for that activity because that's the biggest danger for most companies is when they're outside their active outside their their region. Now mm -hmm. that doesn't stop if somebody logs inside the United States because we don't lock outside the United States. So then that's where we start looking at um, number of failed logins and things like that, that we kind of weigh on and whether we'll respond to it or not. That's so, where okay. Unify is going to come into play for you too, Chris. Yeah. Um, for those of you who aren't aware or haven't answered your emails from your account managers, um, Unify <laughs> allows you to actually use the data if you're monitoring your RMM and say, hey, I know this device. I know it belongs to Michelle. If Michelle decides to vacation and go down to Mexico, but she brings her laptop and signs in with that, I don't care. So if you do have jet setters, if you do have CEOs that bounce around to events inside of EMEA or APAC or just generally don't like you messing with their stuff, 
Just tell them they have to use an approved device when they go and they won't get triggered by those. We're following the whole kill chain. We're not stopping at just failed logins. You can even go a little bit more cautious and say, hey, if I see a successful login from outside of an approved location, followed by something I know I don't want something someone doing, like creating email forwarding rules outside of the domain, then take the action. But wait until we see something malicious happen before we you know, raise all the red flags. So you can cater this to a customer. You can even use conditions and say it's specific countries that you want it to do. Like maybe you know they're going to go to Dublin on occasion and they're going to forget to tell you. But if they ever went to Russia, that'd be weird. So if we ever see logins from Russia, take that action immediately. Uh, and that also helps um, now that a lot of the bad actors are making their IP addresses look like they're local. They're localizing those IP addresses. So it doesn't, they may be logging in from Russia, but it appears that they're logging in from Florida and that doesn't get flagged. So having a tool like Unify in place really helps with that as well. And if you don't have it, or if you don't want to use your, your RMM yet, there's conditions and respond for that as well. You can go in and say, hey, if it shows as a known VPN, don't let it happen. If it's shown as a known, known abuser, known attacker, known anonymous, known Bogon, if any of those things are true, take them out. Yep. So all the ways that you can help. Um, there's also this stale account cleanup. Ryan, I'd love for you to speak to this. I, I know we have a lot of accounts here that, that we still monitor that are not necessarily active. They're guest accounts. They're, there are other um, old accounts of, of, you know, maybe somebody leaves the company and, and they don't, your, your customer doesn't come back and tell you. What are the ramifications of something like that? Was that pointed at me or Chris? I'm sorry. Either. Uh, Chris, do you mind if I take it? Yeah, go ahead. They're ingress points. Every single account that you have, whether it's licensed or not, if sign-in is enabled, is a point someone can attack. Um, your resource accounts, those conference rooms, we've actually seen successful attacks from them. Um, they're static passwords. They never have MFA and they have shared connectivity. So if somebody, if login is still enabled, we're going to track it because someone can leverage it and use it against you. Even your admin accounts that you put into your partner's portals, they need to be protected. Uh, I'm going to beat that education drum again. Every partner you talk to needs to understand that the likelihood of your CFO or CTO or CEO falling for something that comes internally is significantly higher than something externally. So we protect every single account that someone could leverage. Microsoft has a pretty clear rule. They say that their best practice is that you should have sign in disabled for any and all accounts that have shared access because they're going to use their credentials to connect to that thing. They don't need the login to it. For guest user accounts, Microsoft suggests after 30 days of non-use, they're disabled. The stale account cleanup feature inside of the organizations tab in our product will allow you to filter for guest user accounts, members, whether they're licensed or not, and their last known sign-in date. Approach your customers probably quarterly at the very least and say, hey, you know, you've got 18 employees and I see 37 accounts here with sign-in enabled. Do these need to be here? If they don't, let's get rid of them. Maybe we'll save you some money if they're licensed. Um, and if we need to keep them, we need to monitor them. So we made that a lot easier. You can go in and check those little boxes to the left and disable sign-in. If it's a guest user account, I'd encourage you to delete it. If it needs to be recreated, it's super simple. If you block sign-in on a guest user account, you'll have to go back in and unblock it if it's needed. So I wouldn't suggest that for guest users. Just delete them. So uh, then, you know, you show them all the different tools. It goes beyond Microsoft 365, although that tends to be the, the largest one. But these are all the tools that you can, um, that, that we protect uh, and that we can help you protect for your customers. And finally, the next steps. At this point, ask them if you are able to run them the SaaS cybersecurity assessment on their environment. You can deliver them a full report of what's happening behind the scenes and provide a comprehensive proposal on how you can help them. I'd like to make a suggestion if you guys take us up on this and you do it. Um, one of the things that has been the most impactful is to set that meeting and say, hey, we're going to run this assessment for two weeks. We'll review what we find, but take a look at it in between. Take a look at it a couple of days after it happens. And if you see something alarming, call them and say, hey, I know we have this meeting and we're going to cover the whole thing, but this is important and I care about your security. We need to address this one today. Let them know that you're there and you're paying attention to things that they had no idea were occurring. We, we've done that a couple of times during assessments. We stopped it to call and let them know that somebody had been compromised. How'd that work, Chris? Worked out really well. Two of them, let's see, we've done it three times in the last four months. Three of them were, two of them were customers. Third one, wrong fit. So. Yeah, that happens. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pause here. That's the uh, brandable slide deck. 
I'm going to pause here to see if there are any questions before we move on to the other pieces. Anything coming in, Michelle? Uh, no, we had a couple from Mark and Chris. Thank you. I think, I think Mark's last one was good enough to read out and give Chris, have Chris give his answer to everyone else, if, if that's okay. Definitely. Mark so, asked if they should be clearly showing and carrying down Microsoft limits of liability to their MSA. Yeah, my, res my, my response is I'm not a lawyer, but you should always be limiting your third-party liabilities, but they should also be signing off on the Microsoft EULA. If you're a CSP, I don't know if that person, if you're referring to a customer that's CSP that you're providing the licenses to, but they should sign off on that understanding and, and walk them through that and make sure they understand that what they're signing. But yeah, talk to your lawyer, make sure you have third party liability in your MSA. Yeah, it took me a while to find that um, that update when it happened last year. I, I don't know how many of you guys scroll two and a half feet down the terms of use page to find new verbiage, but um, I did it and they change it whenever they feel like it. I would encourage you on rare occasion to click it and look at the last updated thing at the top. And if you see that it's recent, dig through, take a look at it. I know it's not fun, but it's important to understand what you and your customers are committing to because nobody reads that stuff. I read it too, but. Me and Chris read that stuff. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be weird together. It's fine. <laughs> so. Oh, we appreciate you guys reading it. Thank you. All right, so let's talk about the pricing strategy calculator. Um, I'm, I'm going to pull it up here in a second, uh, and we're going to talk about some of the different pricing strategies. Um, but essentially, this is this allows you to determine which pricing strategy is going to work best for your organization. There are a few from either bundling it in, adding it on as a as a you know individual line item cost, um, et cetera. So I'm going to move, I'm going to stop sharing again because my screen doesn't like that. We're going to move this over and um, introduce you to the pricing calculator. Fun. Um, so Ryan, um, let's talk about some of these add on pricing, I think speaks for itself. You charge your cost, uh, your markup, et cetera. Yep. That's, that's fairly straightforward. So, so the concept behind this thing is there, there's a couple of different ways to look at it. And this is actually, uh, the underside of a much more interesting calculator that we built, uh, that uh, predates, I think a lot of the stuff that we put in this, um, book which really compares the capabilities of SAS alerts and business premium to just using E5 or E3 to kind of indicate to your partners, like, look, we don't have to get you E5 licensing to get a year's worth of audit logs. Um, we can get you business premium, which has everything you need for your business for 60% of the price um, and layer on security to get the pieces that are missing without that. And I say that because E5 gives you a year's log retention. Um, so does SAS alerts. If you go to business premium, you get 30 days. That's not enough. Most of the time, you won't even notice something is wrong until well after a 30-day window. So the whole premise of this pricing calculator is to say, hey, here's the positioning I want to use for you. Business premium is good for you. I'll save you some money over the bigger e-licenses where this is applicable. Um, and here's what you're going to end up paying. So it's built for you to add it out and then show to your partner what they would be paying for and what they'd be getting. I hope that makes sense. Go to market strategies up top, kind of you, you this is a, what is a, one of those old books, like not Mad Libs per se, but like your own story. If you uh -huh. pick this answer, flip to page 87. If you pick this answer, flip to 89, uh, choose your adventure. So yeah. every one of those up top has a marketing strategy. You pick the one that you identify with most and you, and you specify what you anticipate needing for your, your rate for it to be worth your effort. You want to go through one in, a, in specific, Amy, as an example, or? Um, if anyone wants us to go through one specific. I, I assume most people favor the bundle, but we are on a prospecting and selling website, our, our webinar, so. No, nobody's going to, nobody's going to help us out here. All right. <laughs> Let's go prospecting. All right. All right, so we've read up top. I'll, I'll read along if you guys don't feel like leaning into your screens. Uh, approximately 10% of MSPs have decided to use SAS alerts primarily as a prospecting tool. They sign up for the monthly minimum, which has changed, by the way. We'll update that uh, and run the SAS cyber assessments against pro prospective customers to identify security gaps in the SAS applications as part of the sales process. 
MSPs who are using SAS alerts, SAS assessments as a prospecting tool can spend $1,920 a year to potentially close tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands in annually recurring revenue. Um, I'm going to pause and give you an example. We have a few of our partners who have taken the approach that we encourage, which is take this tool, put it on every single incumbent customer that you have, do it on the first or the second of the month, run it for two and a half, three weeks, go back into the tool and break the connection to Microsoft. The reason I'm telling you to do that is we'll allow you to prospect for free. If you're a partner, if you're on the platform, you can prospect for free. So run it for two and a half weeks, gather the data, set those meetings, those QBRs, whatever you call them with the customer and say, hey, ran this tool for you, you're welcome, no cost. Here's what I found. Here's the things that I'm worried about for you. And this is what we're gonna to do to protect it going forward. If you do not want me to protect these things, I need you to flatly state that I'm not responsible for anything that happens inside of your business um, email. And you can go over those statistics from the, the pitch deck while you're doing this. Otherwise, I'm moving forward this with this at this price point, and you can anticipate a success rate of your assessments. Standing as it is now with the partners of ours that have done this, the take rate is over 90%. So that's for incumbent customers, not for prospects. You see uh, C21 down there, average close rate as a result of assessments. You can go in and specify what you think your take rate will be, and this will allow you to forecast based on the average size of the customer, um, the price that you're going to charge them, the price that you're paying, how much ARR you will make off of it, and how much total the ROI will be for you. Point of the prospecting calculator is to, to show you pretty much that there's a value in here to doing that. This is actually going to pay out for you. So going back to that previous statement, more than 90% of the customers, when you take that approach, will say yes and take this on. It will, sim it will simplify your workload, streamline your response to threats, make you a stickier MSP, and give them a level of security that they didn't even know existed. And this will help you quantify what that's going to be worth to you as an MSP. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Now, Chris, you use this as a prospecting tool. Um, you, you mentioned that earlier. Yep. Um, what what pricing strategy have you found works best for your business of the others? I, I don't do, I don't use it as a standalone. I use it as part of a risk assessment. So I bundle it already in with that. Okay. Um, so it's one of the it's one of the first things that we run during the risk assessment, just to kind of see where people are from a security standpoint. So we can see, hey, did they turn MFA on by default or do they just not care? Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that really kind of sets that up. And then what we'll use, we'll use that data and we'll, as we go through questionnaires with them to really dig more into it. Um, I like what Ryan said about just going out to people and just offer an assessment though. I haven't done that. I should try to do that. Uh, we also bundle it uh, with an advanced security bundle that we have with our existing customers. So we, we go through, we do a risk assessment for them and then we, we sell them an entire bundle and we include SAS alerts inside of that. So that's how we do it. I love the, uh, the something that one of my partners said to me last week. He, he had a webinar, invited me to it, which was flattering, uh, with all of his partners, all of his customers joined. And they basically went through what we're talking about right now. They said, hey, we already did this. It's on your systems. We've contacted you with what we found. Uh, didn't go over anybody's data because that would be wildly insensitive. Um, they said, we're implementing this. Um, we're going to do it for all of you. And we, we kind of have to insist. Now, if you're going to come to me and say, hey, now's not a good time for a price increase. We just signed on for some, whatever the scenario is, that's okay. I understand and we'll work with you, but we don't want to take it off. So if you want me to defer the billing for this until the next time we negotiate, I'll do that for you. But the, the security that this brings is too important for me to remove it. So find a way to work with your partners. The margins are, are kind of ridiculous on average. Our partners that bundle this in charge between three and five dollars per user. Um, some of them go way higher, and they kind of like have built themselves out to be their own XDR. I think the highest one that I'm familiar with is ten dollars a user. There's another one that's about eight dollars a user, but they're in the mid market. Um, so, if you want to challenge people to go find a better deal, though, if you're charging three, four, or five dollars, point them towards tools like Avanon, which is a phenomenal tool at nine dollars a user to the end customer. You're offering to take the work off of them and do it for significantly cheaper than any tool that's going to sell direct. It should be easy. Yeah, we, we found really good success with, with um, just co-managed deals. Yeah. From so, that, that could be the entry point into a co-managed deal too, is just offering this. Like we've done a risk assessment, but one of the things we sold, maybe they didn't go with everything else, but they've, they've went with sales alerts before. So. Yeah, people look we, at it as we just saw it. They really should be looking at it as a foot in the door. Um, Mark has a question. He's wondering if there are any topics around mobile devices. I don't know if we need a little more info on that, but 
Well, it, on the SaaS alerts front, uh, no, not really, uh, because we don't particularly care about the device. We don't care at all. So I check my phone incessantly every day. It's probably the thing I touch the most, obviously. I check my mail from it and it doesn't really matter because they're following my behavior. Uh, one of the things that you'll get out of Unify is we do show you the device, whether it's, whether it's a mobile OS or an Android OS. So I know that my techs, if they ever saw me log in from a mobile OS that wasn't Android, they'd know it wasn't me. So you can actually build Unify to detect what you know those folks use. If they are a diehard Mac user and you see them popping in from anything else, that can be a critical alert of its own because um, either they've gotten smart and decided to go to Android or they've been hacked. But really whoa. for following SaaS applicants, <laughs> don't. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Shouldn't say that. No, I mean, I'm going to stick to my side of the uh, the argument. Eh. I'm also a Dolphins fan, so you can't really take anything I say for. Eh. I mean, the, the, the Play Store doesn't have any fake apps or anything. Okay, okay cool. we can do this later. We'll have another, we'll have another <laughs> webinar to discuss why I have the superior operating system. Okay. <laughs> But no, so there is a value to it, but as far as user behavior uh, anomalies and what we care about, the endpoint doesn't matter anymore. Well, I think to your point too, like if you have the data, you're able to make better decisions and, and put in different controls as well. So when you start looking at the data and you, and you, and you want to put in controls, let's say you want to do conditional access policies, a lot of this data can help you form those policies. It gives you, it gives you the backbone to, for you to secure the customer more. So I think, I think that's, other than the fact that Android is an inferior operating system, we it gives you it gives you more data to to basically make better decisions. I think that's the the key part part about all this is you can make better decisions as MSP for your customers and help keep them safer. Chris, because you're such a good partner, I'll let you have the last word on that. Um, I'm hoping towards the end of this that we're going to put up yep. a link to the webinar on August third, because to Chris's point, one of the most important things you can do is configure these tenants properly in the first place. August 3rd, we're going to re be releasing a module that'll help you do exactly that, included in the cost of the product you're already paying for. If you have questions about it, you can reach out to your account manager. If you're not a partner yet, thoroughly encourage you to reach out to Daniel Sapp. He's on this. You can send a message to one of us as a, one of the panelists if you're curious, um, and we'll get you some more information. But we can help you with that. Make sure conditional access policies are set up right. Make sure MFA isn't enabled, it's enforced. Uh, make sure data loss prevention where you have the licensing, licensing for it is configured properly across all the tenants, not one by one, which can be exhausting. Um, and another little um, public service announcement. If you guys haven't come across it yet, you're going to find a lot of your partners do not have audit logging enabled and they don't know it. SAS alerts is a really good way to surface that because we're going to tell you as soon as you connect them. And if you don't have audit logging enabled and you get a business email compromise and go through an IR, it's going to hurt real bad. I can't tell you how many people have come to us that had BECs that didn't have auto logging turned on. Microsoft, I, I, it's default now. I think it's yeah. default now for some new tenants. No, so like, Microsoft, we have yet to figure out a pattern. We're still actively working on it. Yeah. Does not automatically enable it for everyone. At first, we thought it was people that came from Exchange into yep. it, got it. And then we thought it was like premium licenses. It's not. There's just some are on and some are off. Go into their tenant, go into compliance, click in the audit. You'll see a big blue banner up top. Click it and it'll turn on audit logging. I'd say 30% of the MSPs or 30% of the MSP customers that we've run into issues with, no audit logging. So if they had an issue, good luck finding out or remediating it. You, you get seven days of uh, sign-in logs. That's it. that's it. Once you turn it on, yeah, that's all you get. You don't get anything else. So yeah, you definitely want to make sure that's on. All right. So Michelle shared a link to the event on August 3rd that Ryan mentioned. And then we'll wrap up just mentioning our, our SASE report, SAS Applications Security Insights Report. Um, next month in August, as part of this webinar series, we're going to take a, a deeper dive into this report, and we're also going to have some new data to share to share at that point. So be on the lookout for an invite uh, for the sake of time and to, to open this up for a little bit more Q&A. Um, that's as far as we're going to go on SASE report. So take a look at it. We've got some new data coming here in the next 30 days and be on the lookout for an invite. So with that, um, just gonna open it up for overall general Q&A. Final thoughts from Ryan or Chris that you'd like to share? Um, anything at all? No, I clicked on the link. I'm gonna be at that event now. Yeah, do yeah. it. Okay. Uh, yeah. We're excited about RSVP. it. RSVP, thank you. And then yeah. we'll go right to your calendar. So you have no excuse to miss it. It's done. Yeah.
Um, Mark was asking in the chat uh, yeah. why iOS over Android seems easier to manage Android from a security point of view. Mark, <laughs> partner of the month. Okay. We can. You don't it's have an not, answer to that one. So you're just well, I, I, I do. There's more vulnerabilities on, on Android than there is on iOS. The Play Store is more of a wild, wild west than the iOS store. From an MDM perspective, yeah, rolling out Apple is a little more complicated. It really depends on how they're how the customer's set up. Um, if you stick with Samsung, you know, Google, stuff like that, obviously you're going to be a little more secure than if you just go out to these smaller manufacturers who don't care and preload malware on their Android devices when they ship them out. Ryan doesn't want to admit that, but that happens all the time. I stopped listening when you started talking about Apple's OS. So, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really customer dependent on what they're trying to do. No, I don't disagree. Um, it is it is the ideal phone for teenage girls and soccer moms alike because they are not technically savvy. So. Yeah, he's just mad because he doesn't get that blue, me, uh, blue box on the, on the chatting. Yeah. Take offense to that. Uh, <laughs> you can't take offense if you are a soccer mom. <laughs> but that's saying I'm not tech savvy either, though. Uh, and I'm Why can't I be mom, everything? So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, guys. Well, um, with that, just Ryan mentioned, if you know, if, if you're a, a partner and you want more information, um, talk with your account manager. They can walk you through the cyber assessment report, how to pull it if you haven't used it before. Um, give us a call. We'll put you in touch with Daniel Sapp or somebody else from the sales team if you'd like a deeper dive. If you are not yet a SaaS Alerts partner, um, either way, I hope you can make use of some of the information that we've shared today and some of the pieces of the toolkit. And um, yeah. Kurt gave us a good little tidbit in the q and It wasn't a question, just kind of an observation. And he's right. And I've actually reported on this in one of my articles that I wrote. Uh, according to the National Cybersecurity Alliance, almost two-thirds of small to medium businesses, she clicked, answered while I was reading it. Oh, sorry. It's in the go out of business. It's okay. Go out of business within six months of an attack. Think of all the employees and their families that depend on those jobs. Yeah. Um, that, that was a something they've been talking about since the early ransomware days. Some of those things are just impossible to recover from unless you're unique enough to be the only only show in town for what you do. Getting hit like that and being taken offline means that your competitors are going to pick up your business and it's going to be really hard to claw that back. So being able to avoid these things and not become a statistic and let your livelihood continue being your livelihood is wildly critical. Couldn't say it any better. Yeah. We, great we way talk to customers every day for that. So, all right. Um, I think Mark wants to pick some brains in there. I'm not sure who he's giving his number to, but we well, can also. Oh, no, but <laughs> that was right. You should, Chris you should have Max, sent so. that. You should have sent. You, oh, at least you sent it to host and panelists. I was going to say, don't drop Okay. Okay. Right okay. Chat, so, but um, no, I mean, if you guys want to continue the conversation, you know, yeah. join our sassy calls on Thursdays. Um, this week and next week, we have Bo Bullock on from Black Hills information security um who's going to be going through a um attack mm -hmm. what sorry just backdoors and breaches is that what you were yes. saying yes yeah exactly <laughs> um but i just dropped the link to those calls as well and that's more of a it's a more of a meeting setup people can feel free to just jump in and chat whenever they want so it's a little more casual always a fun time yes i appreciate the opportunity to talk with all of you and i hope you got something valuable out of this yeah me too I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's been, it's been a good time. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. All right. All right. Thanks, Bye. guys. Bye.